Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 500. I will go on waiting. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello, and welcome to episode 500. craftlet has been going on a long time, and we've listened to a lot of really great books. And of all of them, I can only think of one other book that has affected me at the end as much as this book has. I don't know if it's because of the timing, or if it's just because Lucy Maud Montgomery is a genius, or if it's a combination of all of that. But if you're anything like me, or if you're feeling anything like me lately, you might want to grab some tissues. There isn't a whole lot that you need to know before we listen. I will share quite a few bits and pieces of what I think are kind of cool things about these last few chapters after you've listened to them. And add some resonance and layers to what might on the outside appear to be a pretty simple story about a pretty simple girl. But as we know from having heard from many listeners, this book was not so simple or right offable to them in their formative years. And I think as we head in these last five chapters towards the end of the book, it became a little clearer to me and I hope it becomes clear to you as well, just how well-constructed this narrative is, especially when you take into account uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery's Scottish upbringing, the fact that she was married to a minister, that her love of literature and the way that story had supported her during her lifetime. And then, of course, what we know about her towards the end and how, how hard things got for her, especially after World War I. It makes what she does with Anne all the more resonant to me and and really beautiful. So the few things to alert you to as we head into the chapters. The first is a quotation or a reference to a quotation that I had never come across before. Feeling like a cat in a strange garret. This goes back to American literature around 1850. And it's kind of exactly what it sounds like, like being a cat in a strange place, a garret being uh, a room, often a rented room, a pie, uh, like an attic room or under the eaves where a cat might prowl around, which would lead me to think that this was kind of a twofold statement, that on the one hand, when you are a cat in a new environment, you are prowling around, you want to know where you are, you take some time to kind of figure it all out. But also that being put into a strange environment makes you something of a scaredy cat. So it could go either way, uh, the way that it is used in our chapter today. But I thought it was kind of an interesting turn of phrase, too. So learn something new. You will hear a phrase that we haven't heard since a Jane Austen book, and that is a reduced gentlewoman. I was really surprised to hear this because I thought by this time, pretty much... A hundred years after Jane Austen was finished, almost finished doing her thing, we come back to this this phrasing. A reduced gentlewoman would be someone who had been born into gentility, who had a a quote-unquote good family and a good upbringing and had been part of society. But reduced circumstances means she no longer has her money. So either her husband took off with it all or her husband had been managing it and died and she no longer had any rights to it. One way or another, she was no longer able to live the way that she had been raised to live. So you will hear that go by shortly into our first chapter today. You will hear a reference to Redmond College. Uh, This is actually the name of a college that's completely made up by Lucy Maud Montgomery. There was a college in Halifax, 
at the time. But for whatever reason, Lucy Maud Montgomery didn't want to use that name in her book. So she didn't. She just made one up, as she has every right to. You will hear the use of the word literally in a way that any teenager in America could use it today. I was stupefied when I heard it. And then I remembered who was saying it and thought, wow, nothing's changed <laughs> at all since Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote this book. Awesome. There is an allusion to a chunk of Milton, actually. Uh, Milton wrote in 1644, I cannot praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue, unexercised and unbreathed, that never sallies out and sees her adversary, but slinks out of the race where that immortal garland is to be run for, not without dust and heat. So this idea of an immortal garland being worth going out and getting dirty and working hard for. The immortal garland, you will hear another archaic term replacing garland, and you will hear immortal chaplet, which is just another word for garland. If you've been listening to Craftlet forever, or if you've gone back and listened to Forever Ago on Craftlet, you may recall me mentioning a particular short story when we did uh, American Regionalist Writers way back, early days, right after Pride and Prejudice. You will hear the title of one of those Regionalist Writers stories that I mentioned ever so long ago. Sarah Orne Jewett wrote The Country of Pointed Furs in 1896, and you will hear pointed furs referred to. And it's clearly Lucy Maud Montgomery picking up on Sarah Orne Jewett, which is kind of cool. You will hear the term oculist. Oculist just being the kind of old-fashioned word for an eye doctor, but that's what they call them. Something that we have not talked about before, but something that is connected to kind of a joke that Marilla makes uh, later in our chapters the middle middle chapter today, chapter 36, The Glory and the Dream. There is a play on Josie Pye's name. Nothing could have made me happier <laughs> than coming across this. So Josie Pye, her name, is actually kind of a dig at her from the get-go because Lucy Maud Montgomery knows that a Joe Pye, J-O-E-P-Y-E, -E, a Joe Pye is a weed, kind of like a thistle, kind of like a th small thistle. So, you know, purple and kind of fuzzy and doesn't really seem to have any purpose except sticking to your socks and annoying you. So <laughs> I have never loved Lucy Maud Montgomery as much as I did when I read that. That's just fantastic. You will hear a reference to notes. We have come across this before in other books that we've read together, but just as a refresher, getting a note from a bank would be similar to getting a, a loan. So you, you write a note that you promise to repay the money that you are given in exchange for that note. These are usually unsecured loans, so it's not like a mortgage or, I don't know, putting your plow up as collateral for a loan. It's just an IOU and nothing more than that. It's still a legal document. It's still you actually promising back when promises meant something to own it and pay back what you owe. And that's pretty much everything you're going to need from me before we start listening to our chapters. Kim Suckert absolutely knocks these chapters out of the park. I mean, she's been good. We know that. That's a duh. But I actually had to play a few bits from these chapters for Andrew because I just wanted him to appreciate some mighty fine acting on the part of our narrator and Anne and Marilla and all of the voices that matter. She's just so good. And I did write to her after I heard the very, very last of the very, very last chapter and listened to it two or three times. I wrote back to her to let her know that as I was preparing for the book, I listened to at least two, maybe three different versions of the audiobook. Two, it was three, two from my library and one from Audible. And the one from Audible is read by a rather well-known actress. And I can honestly say that we won. Kim knocks them all out. And as I said, it's never more important 
than listening to her in these final chapters as we see Anne really grow up some. And with that, here we go, listening to chapters 34, 35, 36, 37, and 38, the last chapter in Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery, read for us by Kim Zuckert. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery, read by Kim Zuckert. Chapter 34, A Queen's Girl. The next three weeks were busy ones at Green Gables, for Anne was getting ready to go to Queen's, and there was much sewing to be done and many things to be talked over and arranged. Anne's outfit was ample and pretty, for Matthew saw to that, and Marilla for once made no objections whatever to anything he purchased or suggested. More, one evening she went up to the East Gable with her arms full of a delicate pale green material. "'Anne, here's something for a nice light dress for you. I don't suppose you really need it. You've plenty of pretty waists, but I thought maybe you'd like something real dressy to wear if you were asked out anywhere of an evening in town to a party or anything like that. I hear that Jane and Ruby and Josie have got evening dresses, as they call them, and I don't mean you shall be behind them. I got Mrs. Allen to help me pick it in town last week, and we'll get Emily Gillis to make it for you. Emily's got taste, and her fits aren't to be equaled.' "'Oh, Marilla, it's just lovely!' said Anne. Thank you so much. I don't believe you ought to be so kind to me. It's making it harder every day for me to go away. The green dress was made up with as many tucks and frills and shirrings as Emily's taste permitted. Anne put it on one evening for Matthew's and Marilla's benefit, and recited the maiden's vow for them in the kitchen. As Marilla watched the bright animated face and graceful motions, her thoughts went back to the evening Anne had arrived at Green Gables, and memory recalled a vivid picture of the odd, frightened child in her preposterous yellowish-brown wincy dress, the heartbreak looking out of her tearful eyes. Something in the memory brought tears to Marilla's own eyes. "'I declare my recitation has made you cry, Marilla,' said Anne, gaily stooping over Marilla's chair to drop a butterfly kiss on that lady's cheek. "'Now that I call a positive triumph.' "'No, I wasn't crying over your piece,' said Marilla, who would have scorned to be betrayed into such weakness by any poetry stuff. "'I just couldn't help thinking of the little girl you used to be, Anne, and I was wishing you could have stayed a little girl, even with all your queer ways. You've grown up now, and you're going away, and you look so tall and stylish and so, so different altogether in that dress, as if you didn't belong in Avonlea at all.' and I just got lonesome thinking it was all over. Marilla! Anne sat down on Marilla's gingham lap, took Marilla's lined face between her hands, and looked gravely and tenderly into Marilla's eyes. I'm not a bit changed. Not really. I'm only just pruned down and branched out. The real me, back here, is just the same. It won't make a bit of difference where I go or how much I change outwardly. At heart, I shall always be your little Anne, who will love you and Matthew and dear Green Gables more and better every day of her life. Anne laid her fresh young cheek against Marilla's faded one and reached out a hand to pat Matthew's shoulder. Marilla would have given much just then to have possessed Anne's power of putting her feelings into words, but nature and habit had willed it otherwise and she could only put her arms close about her girl and hold her tenderly to her heart, wishing that she need never let her go. Matthew, with a suspicious moisture in his eyes, got up and went out of doors. Under the stars of the blue summer night he walked agitatedly across the yard to the gate under the poplars. "'Well, now, I guess she ain't been much spoiled,' he muttered proudly. I guess my putting in my oar occasional never did much harm after all. She's smart and pretty, and loving, too, which is better than all the rest. She's been a blessing to us. There never was a luckier mistake than what Mrs. Spencer made. If it was luck, don't believe it was any such thing. It was Providence, because the Almighty saw we needed her, I reckon. The day finally came when Anne must go to town. She and Matthew drove in one fine September morning, 
after a tearful parting with Diana and an untearful practical one, on Marilla's side at least, with Marilla. But when Anne had gone, Diana dried her tears and went to a beach picnic at White Sands with some of her Carmody cousins, where she contrived to enjoy herself tolerably well, while Marilla plunged fiercely into unnecessary work and kept at it all day long with the bitterest kind of heartache, the ache that burns and gnaws and cannot wash itself away in ready tears. But that night, when Marilla went to bed, acutely and miserably conscious that the little gable room at the end of the hall was untenanted by any vivid young life and unstirred by any soft breathing, she buried her face in her pillow and wept for her girl in a passion of sobs that appalled her when she grew calm enough to reflect how very wicked it must be to take on so about a sinful fellow creature. Anne and the rest of the Avonlea scholars reached town just in time to hurry off to the academy. That first day passed pleasantly enough in a whirl of excitement, meeting all the new students and learning to know the professors by sight and being assorted and organized into classes. Anne intended taking up second-year work, being advised to do so by Miss Stacy. Gilbert Blythe elected to do the same. That meant getting a first-class teacher's license in one year instead of two, if they were successful. But it also meant much more and harder work. Jane, Ruby, Josie, Charlie, and Moody Spurgeon, not being troubled with the stirrings of ambition, were content to take up the second-class work. Anne was conscious of a pang of loneliness when she found herself in a room with fifty other students, not one of whom she knew, except the tall, brown-haired boy across the room, and knowing him in the fashion she did did not help her much, as she reflected pessimistically. Yet she was undeniably glad that they were in the same class. The old rivalry could still be carried on, and Anne would hardly have known what to do if it had been lacking. I wouldn't feel comfortable without it, she thought. Gilbert looks awfully determined. I suppose he's making up his mind here and now to win the medal. What a splendid chin he has. I never noticed it before. I do wish Jane and Ruby had gone in for first class, too. I suppose I won't feel so much like a cat in a strange garret when I get acquainted, though. I wonder which of the girls here are going to be my friends. It's really an interesting speculation. Of course, I promised Diana that no Queen's girl, no matter how much I liked her, should ever be as dear to me as she is, but I've lots of second-best affections to bestow. I like the look of that girl with the brown eyes and the crimson waist. She looks vivid and red-rosy. There's that pale, fair one gazing out the window. She has lovely hair and looks as if she knew a thing or two about dreams. I'd like to know them both, know them well, well enough to walk with my arm about their waists and call them nicknames. But just now I don't know them, and they don't know me, and probably don't want to know me particularly. Oh, it's lonesome. It was lonesomer still when Anne found herself in her hall bedroom that night at twilight. She was not to board with the other girls, who all had relatives in town to take pity on them. Miss Josephine Barry would have liked to board her, but Beechwood was so far from the academy that it was out of the question. So Miss Barry hunted up a boarding house, assuring Matthew and Marilla that it was the very place for Anne. "'The lady who keeps it is a reduced gentlewoman,' explained Miss Barry. "'Her husband was a British officer, and she's very careful what sort of boarder she takes. Anne will not meet with any objectionable persons under her roof. The table is good, and the house is near the academy in a quiet neighborhood. All this might be quite true, and indeed proved to be so, but it did not materially help Anne in the first agony of homesickness that seized upon her. She looked dismally about her narrow little room, with its dull, papered, pictureless walls, its small iron bedstead and empty bookcase, and a horrible choke came into her throat as she thought of her own white room at Green Gables, where she would have had the pleasant consciousness of a great green still outdoors, of sweet peas growing in the garden and moonlight falling on the orchard, of the brook below the slope and the spruce boughs tossing in the night wind beyond it, of a vast starry sky and the light from Diana's window shining out through the gap in the trees. Here there was nothing of this. Anne knew that outside of her window was a hard street, with a network of telephone wires shutting out the sky, the tramp of alien feet and a thousand lights gleaming on strangers' faces. She knew that she was going to cry, and fought against it. "'I won't cry. It's silly and weak, 
and there's the third tear splashing down by my nose. There are more coming. I must think of something funny to stop them. Well, there's nothing funny except what is connected with Avonlea, and that only makes things worth four or five. I'm going home next Friday, but that seems a hundred years away. Oh, Matthew is nearly home by now, and Marilla is at the gate, looking down the lane for him. Six, seven, eight. Oh, there's no use in counting them. They're coming in a flood presently. I can't cheer up. I don't want to cheer up. It's nicer to be miserable. The flood of tears would have come, no doubt, had not Josie Pye appeared at that moment. In the joy of seeing a familiar face, Anne forgot that there had never been much love lost between her and Josie. As a part of Avonlea life, even a pie was welcome. "'I'm so glad you came up,' Anne said sincerely. "'You've been crying,' remarked Josie, with aggravating pity. "'I suppose you're homesick. Some people have so little self-control in that respect. I've no intention of being homesick, I can tell you. Town's too jolly after that pokey old Avonlea. I wonder how I ever existed there for so long. You shouldn't cry, Anne. It isn't becoming, for your nose and eyes get red, and then you seem all red.' I had a perfectly scrumptious time in the academy today. Our French professor is simply a duck. His mustache would give you curwallops of the heart. Have you anything eatable around, Anne? I'm literally starving. Ah, I guess likely Marilla would load you up with cake. That's why I called round. Otherwise, I'd have gone to the park to hear the band play with Frank Stockley. He boards the same place I do, and he's a sport. He noticed you in class today and asked me who the red-headed girl was. I told him you were an orphan that the Cuthberts had adopted, and nobody knew very much about what you'd been before that. Anne was wondering if at all solitude and tears were not more satisfactory than Josie Pye's companionship when Jane and Ruby appeared, each with an inch of queen's color ribbon, purple and scarlet, pinned proudly to her coat. As Josie was not speaking to Jane just then, she had to subside into comparative harmlessness. Well said Jane with a sigh. I feel as if I've lived many moons since the morning. I ought to be home studying my Virgil. That horrid old professor gave us twenty lines to start in on tomorrow. But I simply couldn't settle down to study tonight. And methinks I see the traces of tears. If you've been crying, do own up. It will restore my self-respect, for I was shedding tears freely before Ruby came along. I don't mind being goose so much if somebody else is goosey, too. Cake? You'll give me a teensy piece, won't you? thank you. It has the real Avonlea flavor. Ruby, perceiving the queen's calendar lying on the table, wanted to know if Anne meant to try for the gold medal. Anne blushed and admitted she was thinking of it. Oh, that reminds me, said Josie. Queen's is to get one of the Avery scholarships after all. The word came today. Frank Stockley told me. His uncle is one of the board of governors, you know. It will be announced in the academy tomorrow. An Avery scholarship. Anne felt her heart beat more quickly, and the horizons of her ambition shifted and broadened as if by magic. Before Josie had told the news, Anne's highest pinnacle of aspiration had been a teacher's provincial license, first class at the end of the year, and perhaps the medal. But now, in one moment, Anne saw herself winning the Avery Scholarship, taking an arts course at Redmond College, and graduating in a gown and mortarboard before the echo of Josie's words had died away, for the Avery scholarship was in English, and Anne felt that here her foot was on native heath. A wealthy manufacturer of New Brunswick had died, and left part of his fortune to endow a large number of scholarships to be distributed among the various high schools and academies of the maritime provinces, according to their respective standings. There had been much doubt whether one would be allotted to Queen's, but the matter was settled at last, and at the end of the year the graduate who made the highest mark in English and English literature would win the scholarship, $250 a year for four years at Redmond College. No wonder that Anne went to bed that night with tingling cheeks. I'll win that scholarship if hard work can do it, she resolved. Wouldn't Matthew be proud if I got to be a B.A.? Oh, it's delightful to have ambitions. I'm so glad I have such a lot. And there never seems to be any end to them. That's the best of it. Just as soon as you attain to one ambition, you see another one glittering higher up still. It does make life so interesting. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 The Winter at Queen's Anne's homesickness wore off, greatly helped in the wearing by her weekend visits home, 
As long as the open weather lasted, the Avonlea students went out to Carmody on the New Branch Railway every Friday night. Diana and several other Avonlea young folks were generally on hand to meet them, and they all walked over to Avonlea in a merry party. Anne thought those Friday evening gypsyings over the autumnal hills in the crisp golden air, with the home lights of Avonlea twinkling beyond, were the best and dearest hours in the whole week. Gilbert Blythe nearly always walked with Ruby Gillis and carried her satchel for her. Ruby was a very handsome young lady, now thinking herself quite as grown up as she really was. She wore her skirts as long as her mother would let her, and did her hair up in town, although she had to take it down when she went home. She had large, bright blue eyes, a brilliant complexion, and a plump, showy figure. She laughed a great deal, was cheerful and good-tempered, and enjoyed the pleasant things of life, frankly. "'But I shouldn't think she was the sort of girl Gilbert would like,' whispered Jane to Anne. Anne did not think so either, but she would not have said so for the Avery scholarship. She could not help thinking, too, that it would be very pleasant to have such a friend as Gilbert to jest and chatter with and exchange ideas about books and studies and ambitions. Gilbert had ambitions, she knew, and Rupert Gillis did not seem the sort of person with whom such could be profitably discussed. There was no silly sentiment in Anne's ideas concerning Gilbert. Boys were to her, when she thought about them at all, merely possible good comrades. If she and Gilbert had been friends, she would not have cared how many other friends he had, nor with whom he walked. She had a genius for friendship. Girlfriends she had in plenty, but she had a vague consciousness that masculine friendship might also be a good thing to round out one's conceptions of companionship and furnish broader standpoints of judgment and comparison. Not that Anne could have put her feelings on the matter into just such clear definition. But she thought that if Gilbert had ever walked home with her from the train over the crisp fields and along the ferny byways, they might have had many and merry and interesting conversations about the new world that was opening around them and their hopes and ambitions therein. Gilbert was a clever young fellow, with his own thoughts about things, and a determination to get the best out of life and put the best into it. Ruby Gillis told Jane Andrews that she didn't understand half the things Gilbert Blythe said. He talked just like Anne Shirley did when she had a thoughtful fit on, and for her part, she didn't think it any fun to be bothering about books and that sort of thing when he didn't have to. Frank Stockley had lots more dash and go, but then he wasn't half as good-looking as Gilbert, and she really couldn't decide which she liked best. In the academy, Anne gradually drew a little circle of friends about her, thoughtful, imaginative, ambitious students like herself. With the rose-red girl, Stella Maynard, and the dream girl, Priscilla Grant, she soon became intimate, finding the latter pale, spiritual-looking maiden to be full to the brim of mischief and pranks and fun, while the vivid black-eyed Stella had a heart full of wistful dreams and fancies as aerial and rainbow-like as Anne's own. After the Christmas holidays, the Avonlea students gave up going home on Fridays and settled down to hard work. By this time, all the Queen's scholars had gravitated into their own places in the ranks, and the various classes had assumed distinct and settled shadings of individuality. Certain facts had become generally accepted. It was admitted that the medal contestants had practically narrowed down to three, Gilbert Blythe, Anne Shirley, and Lewis Wilson— the Avery scholarship was more doubtful, any one of a certain six being a possible winner. The bronze medal for mathematics was considered as good as won by a fat, funny little up-country boy with a bumpy forehead and a patched coat. Ruby Gillis was the handsomest girl of the year at the academy. In the second-year classes, Stella Maynard carried off the palm for beauty, with a small but critical minority in favor of Anne Shirley. Ethel Marr was admitted by all competent judges to have the most stylish modes of hairdressing, and Jane Andrews, plain, plodding, conscientious Jane, carried off the honors in the domestic science course. Even Josie Pye attained a certain preeminence as the sharpest-tongued young lady in attendance at Queen's. So it may be fairly stated that Miss Stacy's old pupils held their own in the wider arena of the academical course. Anne worked hard and steadily. Her rivalry with Gilbert was as intense as it had ever been in Avonlea School, although it was not known in the class at large, but somehow the bitterness had gone out of it. Anne no longer wished to win for the sake of defeating Gilbert, 
rather for the proud consciousness of a well-won victory over a worthy foe. It would be worth while to win, but she no longer thought life would be insupportable if she did not. In spite of lessons, the students found opportunities for pleasant times. Anne spent many of her spare hours at Beechwood and generally ate her Sunday dinners there and went to church with Miss Barry. The latter was, as she admitted, growing old, but her black eyes were not dim, nor the vigor of her tongue in the least abated. But she never sharpened the latter on Anne, who continued to be a prime favorite with the critical old lady. "'That Anne girl improves all the time,' she said. "'I get tired of other girls. There's such a provoking and internal sameness about them. Anne has as many shades as a rainbow, and every shade is the prettiest while it lasts.' I don't know that she is as amusing as she was when she was a child, but she makes me love her, and I like people who make me love them. Saves me so much trouble in making myself love them. Then, almost before anybody realized it, spring had come. Out in Avonlea, the Mayflowers were peeping pinkly out on the sere barrens where snow wreaths lingered, and the mist of green was on the woods and in the valleys. But in Charlottetown, harassed Queen's students thought and talked only of examinations. "'It doesn't seem possible that the term is nearly over,' said Anne. "'Why, last fall it seemed so long to look forward to, a whole winter of studies and classes. And here we are, with exams looming up next week. Girls, sometimes I feel as if those exams meant everything. But when I look at the big buds swelling on those chestnut trees and the misty blue air at the end of the streets—' They don't seem half so important. Jane and Ruby and Josie, who had dropped in, did not take this view of it. To them, the coming examinations were constantly very important indeed, far more important than chestnut buds or maytime hazes. It was all very well for Anne, who was sure of passing at least, to have her moments of belittling them, but when your whole future depended on them, as the girls truly thought theirs did, you could not regard them philosophically. "'I've lost seven pounds in the last two weeks,' sighed Jane. "'It's no use to say don't worry, I will worry. "'Worrying helps you some. "'It seems as if you were doing something when you were worrying. "'It would be dreadful if I failed to get my license "'after going to Queen's all winter and spending so much money.' "'I don't care,' said Josie Pye. "'If I don't pass this year, I'm coming back next. "'My father can afford to send me.' "'Anne, Frank Stockley says that Professor Tremaine said Gilbert Blythe was sure to get the medal "'and that Emily Clay would likely win the Avery Scholarship.' "'That may make me feel badly tomorrow, Josie,' laughed Anne. "'But just now, I honestly feel that as long as I know the violets are coming out all purple "'down in the hollow below Green Gables, and that little ferns are poking their heads up in Lover's Lane, "'it's not a great deal of difference whether I win the Avery or not.' I've done my best, and I begin to understand what is meant by the joy of the strife. Next to trying and winning, the best thing is trying and failing. Girls don't talk about exams. Look at that arch of pale green sky over those houses, and picture to yourself what it must look like over the purply dark beech woods back of Avonlea. What are you going to wear for commencement, Jane? asked Ruby, practically. Jane and Josie both answered at once, and the chatter drifted into a side eddy of fashions. But Anne, with her elbows on the window sill, her soft cheek laid against her clasped hands, and her eyes filled with visions, looked out unheedingly across city roof and spire to that glorious dome of sunset sky, and wove her dreams of a possible future from the golden tissue of youth's own optimism. All the beyond was hers with its possibilities lurking rosily in the oncoming years. Each year, a rose of promise to be woven into an immortal chaplet. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 The Glory and the Dream On the morning when the final results of all the examinations were to be posted on the bulletin board at Queen's, Anne and Jane walked down the street together. Jane was smiling and happy. Examinations were over, and she was comfortably sure she had made a pass, at least. Further consideration troubled Jane not at all. She had no soaring ambitions, and consequently was not affected with the unrest attendant thereon. For we pay a price for everything we get or take in this world, and although ambitions are well worth having, they are not to be cheaply won, but exact their dues of work and self-denial, anxiety and discouragement— Anne was pale and quiet. In ten more minutes, 
She would know who had won the medal and who the Avery. Beyond those ten minutes, there did not seem just then to be anything worth being called time. "'Of course you'll win one of them anyhow,' said Jane, who couldn't understand how the faculty could be so unfair as to order it otherwise. "'I have no hope for the Avery,' said Anne. "'Everybody says Emily Clay will win it, and I'm not going to march up to that bulletin board and look at it before everybody. I haven't the moral courage. I'm going straight to the girls' dressing room. You must read the announcements and then come and tell me, Jane, and I implore you, in the name of our old friendship, to do it as quickly as possible.' If I have failed, just say so, without trying to break it gently, and whatever you do, don't sympathize with me. Promise me, Jane. Jane promised solemnly, but as it happened, there was no necessity for such a promise. When they went up the entrance steps of Queen's, they found the hall full of boys who were carrying Gilbert Blythe around on their shoulders and yelling at the tops of their voices, Hurrah for Blythe! Medalist! For a moment... Anne felt one sickening pang of defeat and disappointment. So she had failed, and Gilbert had won. Well, Matthew would be sorry. He'd been so sure she would win. And then somebody called out, Three cheers for Miss Shirley, winner of the Avery! Oh, Anne! gasped Jane as they fled to the girls' dressing room amid hearty cheers. Oh, Anne, I'm so proud. Isn't it splendid? And then the girls were around them, and Anne was the center of a laughing, congratulating group. Her shoulders were thumped and her hands shaken vigorously. She was pushed and pulled and hugged, and among it all she managed to whisper to Jane, "'Oh, won't Matthew and Marilla be pleased? I must write the news home. "'Oh, won't Matthew and Marilla be pleased? I must write the news home right away.' Commencement was the next important happening. The exercises were held in the big assembly hall of the academy. Addresses were given, essays read, songs sung, the public award of diplomas, prizes, and medals made. Matthew and Marilla were there, with eyes and ears for only one student on the platform, a tall girl in pale green, with faintly flushed cheeks and starry eyes, who read the best essay and was pointed out and whispered about as the Avery winner. "'Reckon you're glad we kept her, Marilla?' whispered Matthew, speaking for the first time since he had entered the hall, when Anne had finished her essay. "'It's not the first time I've been glad,' retorted Marilla. "'You do like to rub things in, Matthew Cuthbert.' Miss Barry, who was sitting behind them, leaned forward and poked Marilla in the back with her parasol. "'Aren't you proud of that, Anne, girl? I am,' she said. Anne went home to Avonlea with Matthew and Marilla that evening. She had not been home since April, and she felt that she could not wait another day. The apple blossoms were out, and the world was fresh and young. Diana was at Green Gables to meet her. In her own white room, where Marilla had set a flowering house rose on the window sill, Anne looked about her and drew a long breath of happiness. Oh, Diana, it's so good to be back again. It's so good to see those pointed firs coming out against the pink sky. And that white orchard, the old Snow Queen, isn't the breath of the mint delicious? And that tea rose, why, it's a song and a hope and a prayer all in one. And it's good to see you again, Diana. I thought you liked Stella Maynard better than me, said Diana, reproachfully. Josie Pye told me you did. Josie said you were infatuated with her. Anne laughed and pelted Diana with the faded June lilies of her bouquet. "'Stella Maynard is the dearest girl in the world except one, and you are that one, Diana,' she said. "'I love you more than ever, and I have so many things to tell you. "'But just now I feel as if it were joy enough to sit here and look at you. <laughs> "'I'm tired, I think, tired of being studious and ambitious. "'I mean to spend at least two hours tomorrow lying out in the orchard grass, "'thinking of absolutely nothing. "'You've done splendidly, Anne.' I suppose you won't be teaching now that you won the Avery. No, I'm going to Redmond in September. Doesn't it seem wonderful? I'll have a brand new stock of ambition laid in by that time after three glorious golden months of vacation. Jane and Ruby are going to teach. Isn't it splendid to think we all got through, even to Moody Spurgeon and Josie Pye? The Newbridge trustees have offered Jane their school already, said Diana. 
Gilbert Blythe is going to teach, too. He has to. His father can't afford to send him to college next year, after all, so he means to earn his own way through. I expect he'll get the school here if Miss Ames decides to leave. Anne felt a queer little sensation of dismayed surprise. She had not known this. She had expected that Gilbert would be going to Redmond also. What would she do without their inspiring rivalry? Would not work, even at a co-educational college with a real degree in prospect, be rather flat without her friend, the enemy? The next morning at breakfast it suddenly struck Anne that Matthew was not looking well. Surely he was much grayer than he had been a year before. Rilla, she said hesitatingly, when he had gone out, is Matthew quite well? No, he isn't said Marilla, in a troubled tone. "'He's had some real bad spells with his heart this spring, and he won't spare himself a mite. I've been real worried about him. But he's some better than this while back, and we've got a good hired man, so I'm hoping you'll kind of rest and pick up. Maybe you will now you're home. You always cheer him up.' Anne leaned across the table and took Marilla's face in her hands. "'You're not looking as well yourself as I'd like to see you, Marilla. You look tired. I'm afraid you've been working too hard.' You must take a rest now that I'm home. I'm just going to take this one day off to visit all the dear old spots and hunt up my old dreams, and then it will be your turn to be lazy while I do the work. Marilla smiled affectionately at her girl. It's not the work. It's my head. I've got a pain so often now behind my eyes. Dr. Spencer's been fussing with glasses, but they don't do me any good. There's a distinguished oculist coming to the island the last of June, and the doctor says I must see him. I guess I'll have to. I can't read or sew with any comfort now. Well, Anne, you've done real well at Queen's, I must say. To take the first-class license in one year and win the Avery Scholarship? Well, well, Mrs. Lynn says pride goes before a fall, and she doesn't believe in the higher education of women at all. She says it unfits them for women's true sphere. I don't believe a word of it. Speaking of Rachel reminds me, did you hear anything about the Abbey Bank lately, Anne? "'I've heard it was shaky,' answered Anne. "'Why?' "'That's what Rachel said. "'She was up here one day last week and said there was some talk about it. "'Matthew felt real worried. "'All we have saved is in that bank, every penny. "'I wanted Matthew to put it in the savings bank in the first place, "'but old Mr. Abbey was a great friend of father's, and he'd always banked with him. "'Matthew said any bank with him at the head of it was good enough for anybody. "'I think he's only been its nominal head for many years,' said Anne. He's a very old man. His nephews are really at the head of the institution. Well, when Rachel told us that, I wanted Matthew to draw our money right out, and he'd said he'd think of it, but Mr. Russell told him yesterday that the bank was all right. Anne had her good day in the companionship of the outdoor world. She never forgot that day. It was so bright and golden and fair, so free from shadow and so lavish of blossom. Anne spent some of its rich hours in the orchard, she went to the Dryad's Bubble and Willowmere and Violet Vale. She called at the manse and had a satisfying talk with Mrs. Allen. And finally, in the evening, she went with Matthew for the cows, through Lover's Lane to the back pasture. The woods were all gloried through with sunset, and the warm splendor of it streamed down through the hill gaps in the west. Matthew walked slowly with bent head, and, tall and erect, suited her springing step to his. "'You've been working too hard today, Matthew,' she said reproachfully. "'Why won't you take things easier?' "'Well, now I can't seem to,' said Matthew, as he opened the yard gate to let the cows through. "'It's only that I'm getting old, Anne, and keep forgetting it. "'Well, well, I've always worked pretty hard, and I'd rather drop in harness.' "'If I'd been the boy you'd sent for,' said Anne wistfully, "'I'd be able to help you so much now, and spare you in a hundred ways.' I could find it in my heart to wish I had been just for that. Well, now, I'd rather have you than a dozen boys, Anne, said Matthew, patting her hand. Just mind you that, rather than a dozen boys. Well, now, I guess it wasn't a boy that took the Avery scholarship, was it? It was a girl. My girl. My girl that I'm proud of. He smiled his shy smile at her as he went into the yard. Anne took the memory of it with her when she went to her room that night, and sat for a long while at her open window, thinking of the past and dreaming of the future. 
Outside, the Snow Queen was mistily white in the moonshine. The frogs were singing in the march beyond Orchard Slope. Anne always remembered the silvery, peaceful beauty and fragrant calm of that night. It was the last night before sorrow touched her life. And no life is ever quite the same again when once that cold, sanctifying touch has been laid upon it. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 The Reaper Whose Name is Death Matthew? Matthew, what is the matter? Matthew, are you sick? It was Marilla who spoke, alarm in every jerky word. Anne came through the hall, her hands full of white narcissus. It was long before Anne could love the sight or odor of white narcissus again. In time to hear her, and to see Matthew standing in the porch doorway, a folded paper in his hand, and his face strangely drawn and gray. Anne dropped her flowers and sprang across the kitchen to him at the same moment as Marilla. They were both too late. Before they could reach him, Matthew had fallen across the threshold. "'He's fainted!' gasped Marilla. "'Anne, run, run for Martin! Quick! Quick! He's at the barn!' Martin, the hired man, who had just driven home from the post office, started at once for the doctor, calling at Orchard Slope on his way over to send Mr. and Mrs. Barry over. Mrs. Lynde, who was there on an errand, came too. They found Anne and Marilla distractedly trying to restore Matthew to consciousness. Mrs. Lynde pushed them gently aside, tried his pulse, and then laid her ear over his heart. She looked at their anxious faces sorrowfully, and the tears came into her eyes. "'Oh, Marilla,' she said gravely, "'I don't think we can do anything for him.' "'Mrs. Lynde, you don't think—you can't think Matthew is—is—' Anne could not say the dreadful word. She turned sick and pallid. "'Child, yes, I'm afraid of it. Look at his face. When you've seen that look as often as I have, you'll know what it means.' Anne looked at the still face, and there beheld the seal of the great presence. When the doctor came, he said the death had been instantaneous, and probably painless, caused in all likelihood by some sudden shock. The secret of the shock was discovered to be in the paper Matthew had held, and which Martin had brought from the office that morning. It contained an account of the failure of the Abbey Bank. The news spread quickly through Avonlea and all day friends and neighbors thronged Green Gables, and came and went on errands of kindness for the dead and living. For the first time, shy, quiet Matthew Cuthbert was a person of central importance. The white majesty of death had fallen on him, and set him apart as one crown. When the calm night came softly down over Green Gables, the old house was hushed and tranquil, in the parlour lay Matthew Cuthbert, in his coffin, his long grey hair framing his placid face, on which there was a little kindly smile, as if he but slept, dreaming pleasant dreams. There were flowers about him, sweet old-fashioned flowers, which his mother had planted in the homestead garden in her bridal days, and for which Matthew had always had a secret, wordless love. Anne had gathered them and brought them to him, her anguished, tearless eyes burning in her white face. It was the last thing she could do for him. The Marys and Mrs. Lynde stayed with them that night. Diana, going to the east gable, where Anne was standing at her window, said gently, "'Anne, dear, would you like to have me sleep with you tonight?' "'Thank you, Diana.' Anne looked earnestly into her friend's face. "'I think you won't misunderstand me when I say I want to be alone. "'I'm not afraid. "'I haven't been alone one minute since it happened. "'And I want to be. "'I want to be quite silent and quiet "'and try to realize it. "'I can't realize it. "'Half the time it seems to me that Matthew can't be dead. "'The other half it seems... "'as if he must have been dead for a long time. "'And I've had this horrible, dull ache ever since. 
Diana did not quite understand. Marilla's impassioned grief, breaking all the bounds of natural reserve and lifelong habit in its stormy rush, she could comprehend better than Anne's tearless agony. But she went away kindly, leaving Anne alone, to keep her first vigil with sorrow. Anne hoped that the tears would come in solitude. It seemed to her a terrible thing that she could not shed a tear for Matthew, whom she had loved so much, and who had been so kind to her. Matthew, who had walked with her last evening at sunset and was now lying in the dim room below with that awful peace on his brow. But no tears came at first, even when she knelt by her window in the darkness and prayed, looking up to the stars beyond the hills. No tears. Only the same horrible dull ache of misery that kept on aching until she fell asleep, worn out with the day's pain and excitement. In the night she awakened, with the stillness and the darkness about her, and the recollection of the day came over her like a wave of sorrow. She could see Matthew's face smiling at her, as he had smiled when they parted at the gate that last evening. She could hear his voice saying, My girl, my girl that I'm proud of. Then the tears came, and Anne wept her heart out. Marilla heard her and crept in to comfort her. There, there, don't cry so, dear. It can't bring him back. It it isn't right to cry so. I knew that today, but I, could, I couldn't help it then. He'd always been such a good, kind brother to me, but, but God knows best. Oh, just let me cry, Marilla, sobbed Anne. The tears don't hurt me like that ache did. Stay here for a little while with me and keep your, keep your arm around me so... I couldn't have Diana stay. She's good and kind and sweet, but it's not her sorrow. She's outside of it, and she couldn't come close enough to my heart to help me. It's our sorrow, yours and mine. Oh, Marilla, what will we do without him? We've got each other, Anne. I don't know what I'd do if you weren't here, if you'd never come. Oh, Anne, I know I've been kind of strict and harsh with you, maybe. But you mustn't think I didn't love you as well as Matthew did, for all that. I want to tell you now when I can. It's never been easy for me to say things out of my heart. But at times like this, it's easier. I love you as dear as if you were my own flesh and blood, and you've been my joy and comfort ever since you came to Green Gables. Two days afterwards, they carried Matthew Cuthbert over his homestead threshold, and away from the fields he had tilled, and the orchards he had loved, and the trees he had planted. And then Avonlea settled back to its usual placidity, and even at Green Gables affairs slipped into their old groove, and work was done and duties fulfilled with regularity as before, though always with the aching sense of loss in all familiar things. Anne, new to grief, thought it almost sad that it could be so, that they could go on in the old way without Matthew. She felt something like shame and remorse when she discovered that the sunrises behind the firs and the pale pink buds opening in the garden gave her the old inrush of gladness when she saw them, that Diana's visits were pleasant to her, and that Diana's merry words and ways moved her to laughter and smiles. That, in brief... The beautiful world of blossom and love and friendship had lost none of its power to please her fancy and thrill her heart, that life still called to her with many insistent voices. It seems like disloyalty to Matthew somehow to find pleasure in these things now that he's gone, she said wistfully to Mrs. Allen one evening, when they were together in the man's garden. I miss him so much all the time, and yet... Mrs. Allen, the world and life seem very beautiful and interesting to me for all. Today Diana said something funny, and I found myself laughing. I, th I thought when it happened I could never laugh again, and it somehow seems as if I oughtn't to. 
When Matthew was here, he liked to hear you laugh, and he liked to know that you found pleasure in the pleasant things around you, said Mrs. Allen gently. He's just away now, and he likes to know it just the same. I'm sure we should not shut our hearts against the healing influences that nature offers us. But I can understand your feeling. I think we all experience the same thing. We resent the thought that anything can please us when someone we love is no longer here to share the pleasure with us, and we almost feel as if we were unfaithful to our sorrow when we find our interest in life returning to us. I was down to the graveyard to plant a rose bush on Matthew's grave this afternoon, said Anne dreamily. I took a slip of the little white Scotch rose bush his mother brought out from Scotland long ago. Matthew always liked those roses the best. They were so small and sweet on their thorny stems. It made me feel glad that I could plant it by his grave, as if I were doing something that must please him in taking it there to be near him. I hope he has roses like them in heaven. Perhaps the souls of all those little white roses that he has loved so many summers were all there to meet him. I must go home now. Marilla's all alone, and she gets lonely at twilight. She will be lonelier still, I fear, when you go away again to college, said Mrs. Allen. Anne did not reply. She said good night and went slowly back to Green Gables. Marilla was sitting on the front door steps, and Anne sat down beside her. The door was open behind them, held back by a big pink conch shell with hints of sea sunsets in its smooth inner convolutions. Anne gathered some sprays of pale yellow honeysuckle and put them in her hair. She liked the delicious hint of fragrance as some aerial benediction above her every time she moved. Dr. Spencer was here when you were away, Marilla said. He says that the specialist will be in town tomorrow, and he insists I must go in and have my eyes examined. I suppose I'd better go and have it over. I'd be more than thankful if the man can give me the right kind of glasses to suit my eyes. You won't mind staying here alone while I'm away, will you? Martin will have to drive me in, and there's ironing and baking to do. I shall be all right. Diana will come over for company for me. I shall attend to the ironing and baking beautifully. You needn't fear that I'll starch the handkerchiefs or flavor the cake with liniment. Marilla laughed. What a girl you were for making mistakes in them days, Anne. You were always getting into scrapes. I did used to think you were possessed. Do you mind the time you dyed your hair? Yes, indeed, I shall never forget it, smiled Anne, touching the heavy braid of hair that was wound about her shapely head. I laugh a little now sometimes when I think what a worry my hair used to be to me. "'But I don't laugh much, because it was a very real trouble then. "'I did suffer terribly over my hair and my freckles. "'My freckles are really gone, "'and people are nice enough to tell me my hair is auburn now. "'All but Josie Pye. "'She informed me yesterday that she really thought it was redder than ever, "'or at least my black dress made it look redder, "'and she asked me if people who have red hair ever got used to having it. "'Well, I've almost decided to give up trying to like Josie Pye.' I've made what I would once have called a heroic effort to like her, but Josie Pye won't be liked. Josie is a pie, said Marilla sharply, so she can't help being disagreeable. I suppose people of that kind serve some useful purpose in society, but I must say I don't know what it is any more than I know the use of thistles. Is Josie going to teach? No, she's going back to Queens next year. So are Moody Spurgeon and Charlie Sloane. Jane and Ruby are going to teach, and they've both got schools. Jane at Newbridge and Ruby at some place up west. Gilbert Blythe is going to teach too, isn't he? Yes, briefly. What a nice looking fellow he is, said Marilla absently. Saw him in church last Sunday, and he seems so tall and manly. Looks a lot like his father did at the same age. John Blythe was a nice boy. We used to be real good friends, he and I. People called him my beau. Anne looked up with swift interest. Oh, Marilla, and what happened? Why didn't you? We had a quarrel. I wouldn't forgive him when he asked to. I meant to, after a while, but I was sulky and angry, and I wanted to punish him first. He never came back. The Blythes were almighty independent. But I always felt rather sorry. I always kind of wished I'd forgiven him when I had the chance. 
"'So you've had a bit of romance in your life, too,' said Anne softly. "'Yes. Suppose you might call it that. "'You wouldn't think so to look at me, would you? "'But you never can tell about people from their outsides. "'Everybody has forgotten about me and John. "'I'd forgotten myself. "'But it all came back to me when I saw Gilbert last Sunday.' End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 The Bend in the Road Marilla went to town the next day and returned in the evening. Anne had gone over to Orchard Slope with Diana and came back to find Marilla in the kitchen, sitting by the table with her head leaning on her hand. Something in her dejected attitude struck a chill to Anne's heart. She had never seen Marilla sit limply inert like that. "'Are you very tired, Marilla?' "'Yes. No, I, I don't know,' said Marilla, wearily looking up. "'I suppose I am tired, but I haven't thought about it. "'It's not that. "'Did you see the oculist? What did he say?' asked Anne anxiously. "'Yes, I saw. He examined my eyes.' He said that if I give up all reading and sewing entirely and any kind of work that strains the eyes and if I'm careful not to cry and if I wear the glasses he's given me, he thinks my eyes may not get any worse and my headaches will be cured. But if I don't, he says I'll certainly be stone blind in six months. Blind. Anne, just think of it. For a minute, Anne, after her first quick exclamation of dismay, was silent. It seemed to her that she could not speak. Then she said bravely, but with a catch in her voice, Marilla, don't think of it. You know he has given you hope. If you're careful, you won't lose your sight altogether, and if his glasses cure your headaches, it will be a great thing. I don't call it much hope said Marilla, bitterly. What am I to live for if I can't read or sew or do anything like that? Might as well be blind or dead. As for crying, I can't help that when I get lonesome. There, it's no good talking about it. If you get me a cup of tea, I'll be thankful. About done out. Don't say anything about this to anyone for a spell yet, anyway. I can't bear that folks should come here to question and sympathize and talk about it. When Marilla had eaten her lunch, Anne persuaded her to go to bed. Then Anne went herself to the East Gable and sat down by her window in the darkness alone with her tears and her heaviness of heart. How sadly things had changed since she had sat there the night after coming home. Then she'd been so full of hope and joy and the future look rosy with promise. Anne felt as if she had lived years since then. But before she went to bed, there was a smile on her lips and peace in her heart. She had looked her duty courageously in the face and found it a friend, as duty ever is when we meet it frankly. One afternoon, a few days later, Marilla came slowly in from the front yard where she had been talking to a caller. A man whom Anne knew by sight as Sadler from Carmody. Anne wondered what he could have been saying to bring that look to Marilla's face. What did Mr. Sadler want, Marilla? Marilla sat down by the window and looked at Anne. There were tears in her eyes in defiance of the oculist's prohibition, and her voice broke as she said, He heard that I was going to sell Green Gables, and he wants to buy it. Buy it? "'Buy Green Gables?' Anne wondered if she'd heard all right. Oh, "'Marilla, you don't mean to sell Green Gables?' "'Anne, I don't know what else is to be done. "'I've thought it all over. "'If my eyes were strong, I could stay here "'and make out to look after things "'and manage with a good hired man. "'But as it is, I can't. "'I may lose my sight altogether, "'and anyway I'll not be fit to run things. "'Oh, I never thought I'd live to see the day "'when I'd have to sell my home.' but things would only go behind worse and worse all the time till nobody would want to buy it. 
Every cent of our money went in that bank, and there's some notes Matthew gave last fall to pay. Mrs. Lynn advises me to sell the farm and board somewhere, with her, I suppose. It won't bring much, it's small, and the buildings are old, but it'll be enough for me to live on, I reckon. I'm thankful you're provided for with that scholarship, Anne. Sorry you won't have a home to come to in your vacations, that's all. But I suppose you'll manage it somehow. Marilla broke down and wept bitterly. You mustn't sell Green Gables, said Anne resolutely. Oh, Anne, I wish I didn't have to, but you can see for yourself I can't stay here alone. I'd go crazy with trouble and loneliness, and my sight would go. I know it would. You won't have to stay here alone, Marilla. I'll be with you. I'm not going to Redmond. Not going to Redmond? Marilla lifted her worn face from her hands and looked at Anne. Well, what do you mean? Just what I say. I'm not going to take the scholarship. I decided so the night after you came home from town. You surely don't think I could leave you alone in your trouble, Marilla, after all you've done for me? I've been thinking and planning. Let me tell you my plans. Mr. Barry wants to rent the farm for next year, so you won't have any bother over that. And I'm going to teach. I've applied for the school here, but I don't expect to get it, for I understand the trustees have promised it to Gilbert Blythe. But I can have the Carmody School. Mr. Blair told me last night at the store. Of course, that won't be quite as nice or convenient as if I had the Avonlea School. But I can board home and drive myself over to Carmody and back, in the warm weather at least. And even in winter I can come home Fridays. We'll keep a horse for that. Oh, I have it all planned out, Marilla, and I'll read to you and keep you cheered up. You shan't be dull or lonesome, and we'll be real cozy and happy together, you and I. Marilla had listened like a woman in a dream. Oh, Anne, I could get on real well if you were here, I know, but I can't let you sacrifice yourself so for me. It will be terrible. Nonsense, Anne laughed merrily. There's no sacrifice. Nothing could be worse than giving up Green Gables. Nothing could hurt me more. We must keep the dear old place. My mind is quite made up, Marilla. I'm not going to Redmond, and I am going to stay here and teach. Don't you worry about me a bit. But your ambitions and... I'm just as ambitious as ever. Only I've changed the object of my ambitions. I'm going to be a good teacher, and I'm going to save your eyesight. Besides, I mean to study at home here and take a little college course all by myself. Oh, I've dozens of plans, Marilla. I've been thinking them out for a week. I should give life here my best, and I believe it will give its best to me in return. When I left Queens, my future seemed to stretch out before me like a straight road. I thought I could see along it for many a milestone. Now there's a bend in it. I don't know what lies around the bend, but I'm going to believe that the best does. It has a fascination of its own, that bend, Marilla. I wonder how the road beyond goes. What there is of green glory and soft checkered lights and shadows... What new landscapes, what new beauties, what curves and hills and valleys further on. I don't feel as if I ought to let you give it up, said Marilla, referring to the scholarship. But you can't prevent me. I'm sixteen and a half, obstinate as a mule, as Mrs. Lynde once told me, laughed Anne. Oh, Marilla, don't you go pitying me. I don't like to be pitied, and there's no need for it. I'm heart glad over the very thought of staying at dear Green Gables. Nobody could love it as you and I do, so we must keep it. You blessed girl, said Marilla, yielding. I feel as if you'd given me new life. I guess I had to stick it out and make you go to college, but I know I can't, so I ain't going to try. I'll make it up to you, though, Anne. When it became nosed abroad in Avonlea that Anne Shirley had given up the idea of going to college and intended to stay home and teach, there was a good deal of discussion over it. Most of the good folks, not knowing about Marilla's eyes, thought she was foolish. Mrs. Allen did not. She told Anne so in approving words that brought tears of pleasure to the girl's eyes. Neither did good Mrs. Lynde. She came up one evening and found Anne and Marilla sitting at the front door in the warm, scented summer dusk. They liked to sit there when the twilight came down and the white moths flew about in the garden and the odor of mint filled the dewy air. Mrs. Rachel deposited her substantial person upon the stone bench by the door, behind which grew a row of tall pink and yellow hollyhocks, with a long breath of mingled weariness and relief. I declare I'm getting glad to sit down. Been on my feet all day, and two hundred pounds is a good bit for two feet to carry around. 
It's a great blessing not to be fat, Marilla. I hope you appreciate it. Well, Anne, I hear you've given up your notion of going to college. I was real glad to hear of it. You've got as much education now as a woman can be comfortable with. I don't believe in girls going to college with the men and cramming their heads full of Latin and Greek and all that nonsense. But I'm going to study Latin and Greek just the same, Mrs. Lynde, said Anne, laughing. I'm going to take my arts course right here at Green Gables and study everything that I would at college. Mrs. Lynde lifted her hands in holy horror. Anne, surely you'll kill yourself. Not a bit of it. I shall thrive on it. Oh, I'm not going to overdo things. As Josiah Allen's wife says, I shall be medium. But I'll have lots of spare time in the long winter evenings, and I've no vocation for fancy work. I'm going to teach over at Carmody, you know. I don't know it. I guess you're going to teach right here in Avonlea. The trustees have decided to give you the school. Mrs. Lynde, cried Anne, springing to her feet in surprise. Why, I thought they promised it to Gilbert Blythe. So they did. But as soon as Gilbert heard that you had applied for it, he went to them, they had a business meeting at the school last night, you know, and told them that he withdrew his application and suggested that they accept yours. He said he was going to teach at White Sands. Of course, he knew how much he wanted to stay with Marilla, and I must say it was real kind and thoughtful in him, that's what. Real self-sacrificing, too, for he'll have his board to pay at White Sands, and everybody knows he's got to earn his own way through college. So the trustees decided to take you. I was tickled to death when Thomas came home and told me. I don't feel that I ought to take it, murmured Anne. I mean, I don't think I ought to let Gilbert make such a sacrifice for, for me. I guess you can't prevent him now. He signed papers with the White Sands trustees, so it wouldn't do him any good now if you were to refuse. Of course you'll take the school. You'll get along all right now that there are no pies going. Josie was the last of them, and a good thing she was, that's what. There's been some pie or another going to Avonlea school for the last twenty years, and I guess their mission in life was to keep school teachers reminded that Earth isn't their home. Bless my heart, what does all that winking and blinking at the Barry Gable mean? Diana's signaling for me to go over, laughed Anne. You know we keep up the old custom. Excuse me while I run over and see what she wants. Anne ran down the clover slope like a deer and disappeared in the furry shadows of the haunted wood. Mrs. Lynde looked after her indulgently. There's a good deal of the child about her yet in some ways. There's a good deal more of the woman about her in others, retorted Marilla, with a momentary return of her old crispness. But crispness was no longer Marilla's distinguishing characteristic. As Mrs. Lynde told her Thomas that night, Marilla Cuthbert has got mellow, that's what. Anne went to the little Avonlea graveyard the next evening to put fresh flowers on Matthew's grave and water the Scotch rose bush. She lingered there until dusk, liking the peace and calm of the little place, with its poplars whose rustle was like low, friendly speech, and its whispering grasses growing at will among the graves. When she finally left it and walked down the long hill that sloped to the Lake of Shining Waters, it was past sunset and all Avonlea lay before her in a dream-like afterlight, a haunt of ancient peace. There was a freshness in the air, as of a wind that had blown over honey-sweet fields of clover. Home lights twinkled out here and there among the homestead trees. Beyond lay the sea, misty and purple, with its haunting, unceasing murmur. The west was a glory of soft-mingled hues, and the pond reflected them all in still softer shadings. The beauty of it all thrilled Anne's heart, and she gratefully opened the gates of her soul to it. Dear old world, she murmured, you are very lovely, and I am glad to be alive in you. Halfway down the hill a tall lad came whistling out of a gate before the Blythe homestead. It was Gilbert and the whistle died on his lips as he recognized Anne. He lifted his cap, courteously, but he would have passed on in silence if Anne had not stopped, and held out her hand. Gilbert, she said, with scarlet cheeks, I want to thank you for giving up the school for me. It was very good of you, and I want you to know that I appreciate it. Gilbert took the offered hand eagerly. It wasn't particularly good of me at all, Anne. I was pleased to be able to do you some small service. 
Are we going to be friends after this? Have you really forgiven me my old fault? Anne laughed and tried unsuccessfully to withdraw her hand. I forgave you that day by the pond landing, although I didn't know it. What a stubborn little goose I was. I've been... I may as well make a complete confession. I've been sorry ever since. We are going to be the best of friends, said Gilbert jubilantly. We were born to be good friends, Anne. You've thwarted destiny enough. I know we can help each other in many ways. You're going to keep up your studies, aren't you? So am I. Come, I'm going to walk home with you. Marilla looked curiously at Anne when the latter entered the kitchen. Who was that that came up the lane with you, Anne? Gilbert Blythe, answered Anne, vexed to find herself blushing. I met him on Barry's Hill. I didn't think you and Gilbert Blythe were such good friends that you'd stand for half an hour at the gate talking to him, said Marilla with a dry smile. We haven't been. We've been good enemies. But we have decided that it will be much more sensible to be good friends in the future. Were we really there half an hour? It seemed just a few minutes. But you see, we have five years lost conversations to catch up with, Marilla. Anne sat long at her window that night, companioned by a glad content. The wind purred softly in the cherry boughs, and the mint breaths came up to her. The stars twinkled over the pointed firs in the hollow, and Diana's light gleamed through the old gap. Anne's horizons had closed in since the night she had sat there after coming home from Queen's, but if the path set before her feet was to be narrow, she knew that flowers of quiet happiness would bloom along it. The joy of sincere work, and worthy aspiration, and congenial friendship were to be hers. Nothing could rob her of her birthright of fancy, or her ideal world of dreams. And there was always the bend in the road. God's in his heaven. All's right with the world, whispered Anne. Softly, softly. End of chapter 38 And end of Anne of Green Gables Okay, are you better? I assumed, kind of like at the end of Tale of Two Cities, that you probably had to turn off the podcast for a little bit and just kind of be with the end of the book, just kind of sit with it and let it be part of you. There is the part of me that cannot help but look at the beautiful ending to this book and not recognize so much of what was going on in Lucy Maud Montgomery's life, emotional life, and how how hard it must have been to be female then and super crazy smart then and married to a guy who just just wasn't as awesome as she was. I, oh, it just makes me want to go back in time and hug her. Just amazing. And she does some stupendously cool things at the ends of the book, at the ends of the chapters and the ends of the book that I didn't give you a heads up on because I, I didn't want to flag it too much for you. But the other reason that there are things that I didn't share with you beforehand are because I didn't want them to get in the way. It would have taken a long time. So... I kind of front-loaded the quick and easy stuff, and I've saved some of the more uh, in-depth and literarily relevant things for now. So, here we go. Along with learning that the Joe Pie is a weed, and, and giggling, wasn't that awesome? Marilla made a joke. Go, Marilla. She grew up rather nicely there, didn't she? Ah, <sighs> so proud. So proud of Marilla. We have come across this before, this, this event happening before, where people repeat phrases over and over again and are using them incorrectly. The proof of the pudding is in the tasting, not the proof is in the pudding. How could the proof be in the pudding if the pudding is just sitting there? You have to taste it. The proof of the pudding is in the tasting. Or a little learning is a dangerous thing. If you stop there, you miss the drink deep or touch not the Pyurian spring. If you, <laughs> if you took high school science and you got a B plus and you think you know more than scientists who have spent their entire adult life working out problems, I got nothing. I don't even know what to say in situations like that, except, wow, okay, I guess hubris. 
I, I don't I don't know where else to go with it. Uh, but then there's the other one, which if you've listened to Craftlet for a long time, you know, I it's the hill that I continue to die on. Begging the question and raising the question do not mean the same thing. Begging the question is a logical fallacy. Raising the question is exactly what it sounds like. If you say begging the question to make yourself sound smarter, you are in fact doing the opposite. And boy, do I just want to have a sign that I can hold up to people on TV and the radio. And of course, they wouldn't see it if it was a sign. But oh man, it drives me nuts. <sighs> well, I found a new one. I found a new one. And I'm sure many, many Craftlet listeners already know this. I did not. So I got to be enlightened today. And I will share that enlightenment with you now. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. You ready? Here it is. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Right? Pride is out there in advance of destruction, marching at the front of the line. Following in pride's wake is destruction. And being haughty and stuck up with your nose in the air means that the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to fall. And whether that means a big fall, like a, a ginormous metaphorical karmic kind of fall, or literally just tripping over a rock in the road, kind of doesn't matter. Either way, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I always thought pride goeth before a fall sounded weird. Kind of like a little learning is a dangerous thing. It just didn't make sense to me. Or the proof is in the pudding. Didn't make sense to me. Now we know why. I think we have a pretty good clue that anytime any of us hit a phrase where we think, huh, I know that's an old saying. Funny how it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Perhaps we should go look it up. I need to remind myself of that more often because the internet is there and available to us for these things. And yet, I just don't seem to use it nearly enough unless I'm doing a book on Craftlet. Yeah, there were... Oh, it felt like a metric ton of literary illusions in these chapters. I mean, really, Lucy Maud Montgomery pulled out all the stops, and I'm rather convinced that it required zero extra work on her part because she was such a, a huge reader and and clearly so good at just like memorizing Bible verses as a child that there are lines that just stuck with her. And I have a feeling that that has more to do with her more illusion-oriented, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, illusion-oriented bits and pieces in the book than the quotations. And I, th I think it's just because she kind of ingested a lot of these things and, and they lived with her and she didn't have to go look them up. So if she tweaked it a little bit here or there, no big deal. She clearly still knows her stuff. So I skipped over a half dozen, easy, before we get to the chapter the Reaper Whose Name is Death. This comes from Henry Wadsworth, Longfellow's The Reaper and the Flowers. And this is in uh, stanza one. He wrote this in 1839. There is a reaper whose name is death, and with his sickle keen, he reaps the bearded grain at a breath and the flowers that grow between. So that's a little Longfellow for you. And then we have a reference to a John Greenleaf Whittier poem called Snowbound, A Winter's Idol. This was written in 1866. And the stanza that this allusion is drawn from is a, a stanza that focuses on Whittier's younger sister's death, which was fairly recent. Not surprisingly, this allusion comes after Matthew has passed away, and life around Green Gables has been getting back to normal for a while, and Green Gables is starting to find its, its new normal the way life does, even with this huge rend in the fabric of the life. And the line that Lucy Maud Montgomery quotes is the loss in all familiar things. The actual poem in this particular stanza reads thusly, I tread the pleasant paths we trod, I see the violet sprinkled sod, whereon she learned too frail and weak the hillside flowers she loved to seek. Yet, following me where'er I went with dark eyes, full of love's content. The birds are glad. The briar rose fills the air with sweetness. 
All the hills stretch green to June's unclouded sky, but still I wait with ear and eye for something gone which should be nigh. A loss in all familiar things, in flower that blooms and bird that sings. Which reminds me an awful lot of W.H. Auden's beautiful poem that I don't think has ever been more beautifully read than in Four Weddings and a Funeral. Just lovely. Then, following hard on, we have another uh, allusion to a poem. This one is James Whitcomb Riley's poem, Away, which was written in 1884. And this is the reference that Mrs. Allen gave when she said, Matthew, he's just away now. I cannot say, I will not say that he is dead. He's just away. With a cheery smile and a wave of the hand, he's wandered into an unknown land and left us dreaming how very fair it needs must be since he lingers there. And you, oh, you who are the wildest yearn for the old-time step and the glad return, think of him faring on as dear in the love of there as the love of here. And the last one we'll do comes from Robert Browning's Pippa Passes, which he wrote in 1841, and this comes from Part 1, Morning. The years at the spring, the days at the morn, mornings at seven, the hillside dew-pearled, the larks on the wing, the snails on the thorn, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. It's a lovely way to end the book, and it's a lovely book. As always, you are more than welcome to use our phone line, 206-350-1642, to share your thoughts about the book, if you would like to do that. And we get enough responses from you and all the other listeners. Justin and I can kind of arrange them into episode 501 and let you hear what everybody else thought of the book, too. Well, this weekend, with all of the excitement about Doctor Who... And, and the fact that her costume has pockets. Oh, I received an email from Francisca, who wrote to all of us. She said, I remember that you were talking about pockets in women's clothing in one of the Anne of Green Gables episodes. One of the other podcasts I'm subscribed to, 99% Invisible, is doing a three-week series on clothes called Articles of Interest. And I've just started listening to the third episode, which is about pockets. Can you imagine that police women in Oakland, California are wearing male uniforms because the pockets on the female police uniforms are too small? What is with people? Ah! If you still need some material to listen to while you're commuting, I really recommend trying out 99% Invisible. Since I'm probably not the only of your listeners who's in dire need of audio material since you've started your new schedule, it'd be great if you shared this. Thank you for your awesome podcast and all the best for your new endeavors. So. Big thank you to Francisca for letting us know that and and for highlighting the poor police women in Oakland. Good grief. I do have a few voicemails to share with you from way long time before. A couple of the backlog I'm going to save for an extra episode. Should uh, should we get enough people calling in to 206-350-1642 to share your thoughts on Anne of Green Gables or Craftlet now that we've hit 500, which still just blows my mind. We have over 4 million downloads <laughs> and 500 episodes. You guys are pretty awesome. And those of you who've been sticking around since the first, like, 20, you amaze me. <laughs> I just... I always love getting a chance to meet you. And I didn't even get a chance to tell you about Podcast Movement or the MapCon, the Mid-Atlantic Podcast Convention. It was all good, and it made me love you all that much more, because you're the best. But on top of that, I do have three, actually, voicemails to play for you. The first two come from voices you have heard before, and refer specifically to things in recent er episodes slash chapters. The last one goes way back quite a few chapters, but is relevant. And there's something special that I wanted to say after you listen to that one. So here we go. First, Tara, Janalee, and then Megan. Hello, Heather. I was listening to the latest episode of Crackflip, 
where you're talking about your trip to Scotland and it's episode 494, you were speaking of Heather Gems. I know for a fact that on Amazon, on the TV show How It's Made, they show how Heather Gems are made. The whole process of harvesting the Heather and bundling it up, putting it into basically a pressure canner and saturating the Heather stem with dye and then forming it into a big blob with layers of color and with the resin and cutting it and polishing it and they make pens and jewelry and watches and boxes and all kinds of stuff out of it. Again, it's on how it's made. I'm not sure what season it's on, but it is on there. It's on Amazon Prime. I think you have to buy it now because there's so many seasons available for free, but it's on there and you can see how the process happens and it's super, super neat. I'm going to go back to listening and I'll probably call back later. Hey, this is Jen Lee. I am Mitz and Hikes on Ravelry. Um, I'm not finished listening to your latest episode of Anna Green Gables yet, but I had to stop when you mentioned red hair and Scotland and some of the um, stuff that goes on with the treatment of people with red hair. It first reminded me of the term that I've heard used as a description of how poorly certain people were treated, that they were referred to as a red-headed stepchild because being a stepchild wasn't bad enough. They had to be a red-headed stepchild because whatever treatment it was was extra bad or extra poor. <laughs> they were very put upon. So I thought that was interesting and wonder if that may have come out of the um, the prejudice against people with red hair that comes from the United Kingdom area. And the second thing that came to my mind was I don't think that it was an encyclopedia I was reading. I think it might have been a fiction book, a historical fiction. But I remember reading about Set and having someone refer to him as the red-headed god. And that was kind of their shorthand for saying, well, you know, he's the god of chaos and evil. And, and so obviously he would be the red-headed god, which I hadn't linked to the treatment of red-headed people, but the main characters I think of this one, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, um, were from the United Kingdom. Anyway, set as a red-haired god. I can't find confirmation online, but I just did a quick search, so maybe if I dig deeper, I might find something more specific. But I do know that he was associated with the red soil of the desert, and his counterpart, Osiris, was associated with the black soil that was the fertile soil near the river. So that red red coloring comes in, and a lot of the depictions of him or his body is red. He's also associated with some foreign rulers that came in, um, the Hyksos, trying to think when they came in, like, I don't know, 16 or 7 or 16 or 1500 BC, they were foreign people that came in, gained the rulership of Egypt and then ruled the Nile Delta. And because Set was the deity that closest resembled their own chief god, they chose to worship him exclusively. So when they were kicked out of power, the priesthood and most of, a lot of the people um, became quite xenophobic and there was much discrediting of that particular period. But the cult that worshipped Set flourished, and there were certainly people who continued on in the priesthood and in worship of Set. So I don't know how much that relates to what you're talking about with the redheaded stuff, but as a redhead and with at least one other redhead in my immediate family, I kind of have to speak up for them. Thank you for what you do. I love this book. I am loving the reader, and I'm loving the just the, the new journey that this is as, a, as an older person reading Anne as opposed to my initial uh, experience of, of reading her as a child. So thank you for that. Hi, Heather. My name is Megan. I'm a longtime listener, although I did take a long hiatus while I went to medical school and, re- and finished my residency. In fact, today is the last day of my residency. And as things slowed down, I got back into your podcast. I'm actually up to date with the book, almost, with me, Nana Green Gables, but wanted to call about the use of sugared water as an analgesic for babies. So when I learned to do circumcisions, we used what we called sweets for the babies. You know, the baby boy would come in. We would give it a little before the procedure and right after, and it would completely soothe the baby. It was like magic. So I looked it up. The brand we used was Sweet Ease, S-W-E-E-T dash E-A-S-E. Several companies make those. About a 24% sucrose solution in water. 
obviously no medical advice being given, but this is something that works really well for babies who are having a little bit of pain. Anyhow, um, such a pleasure listening again, and I'm so glad that you are still doing this. It's amazing. So Megan, first, congratulations on finishing your residency. Oh my gosh, that's so awesome. Thank you also for giving us the solution, the percentage solution of sucrose to water, because that's so cool and really, really useful information, even though it's not medical advice, which I totally understand. But also, I don't know if congratulations is the right thing to say for you having stuck around for so long and then coming back. That's just, that's mind boggling. And I'll tell you completely honestly, just between you and me, Megan, because <laughs> nobody else is listening. Uh, I had really been thinking about not doing craft lit anymore. The world is too depressing. And you know, I try very hard as much as I can to A, keep Craftlet just talking about books and leave the rest of the world behind. And the few times that I have strayed out into the middle of the road, I've tried to telegraph that to you so that if you didn't want to listen to it, you didn't have to listen to it because what we all have in common is our books. But Megan's voicemail made me think twice because one of the sticking points for me was, but what if people come back and I'm not doing this anymore? I would feel very bad. That would not be good. But the other thing that happened was actually during the prep for this last chapter. Early on in chapter 34, I had a moment where I recognized something in what Lucy Maud Montgomery is saying that is, is very modern and actually has become a political football. And it, it makes me very sad that it has become a political football because I think, I think the we all have much more in common than not is so easy to lose track of in the middle of all the screaming that goes on on camera. And I have to remind myself all the time that what is put on camera, way more so than what is put in newspapers or magazines, what is put on camera is what will keep you watching. And just like it's almost impossible to turn your head away when you see a car accident or the aftermath of a car accident, it is very hard to turn your way from screaming theatricality or viciousness because you're so horrified. If I've learned anything from 500 episodes of Craftlit and from talking to so many Craftlit listeners, it is that it doesn't matter what country you were born in, what country you live in, what language you speak, what accent you use when you speak, what religion you were born into, or what religion you are now. We have so much more about us than what's become identity politics, period. Whether we're women or men or Muslim or Jewish or Christian, whether we are none of the above, one of the things that I keep seeing over and over again is when we have moments like in North and South, when there is such clear anti-Irish, anti-Catholic bias in an otherwise beautiful book, we all have the same reaction. There's the moment of horror. There's the acknowledgement that it was a long time ago. There's the thank God we've learned something. Even if we haven't learned all that much, at least we've learned something. We learned to recognize it. And that has given me more faith in the future. That along with teaching kids, high school kids, has given me more faith in our ability to survive than just about anything. And I, I continuously go back to how wonderful the listeners of the podcast have always been and continue to be. And the place in this book, in this, these chapters, these closing chapters, that really struck me and got me thinking about this was when, early on in chapter 34, we hear how this family has ended up being a family. You have Matthew, you have Marilla. Yeah, they're related by blood, whatever. But they have this girl who has become their daughter. This is not a blood tie at all. And I think it's easy to lose sight of the fact that blood is oftentimes the least important factor in what makes a family a family. I know I have plenty of friends who, for one reason or another, the people they're related to by blood, they can't talk to very easily. But they have a larger family that cares for them, that cares about them, 
that they are there for as well. Oftentimes, adoption is involved. And again, over and over again, it just reminds me how we are far, far more alike in the important ways than we are different. And if you aren't in a place where you get to be in contact with people who are different from you very often. Like when I've been working at home for so long now, if I hadn't had you in my life, I would have had very little contact with people who are different from me. But you have made the world a less scary and dangerous place simply because I know you're there. And I know that you and I have this common bond. And that comforts me at the same time that it makes me sad for people who don't have opportunities like this. I mean, certainly teaching in New York City, I got to meet a lot of people who I never would have had a chance to meet before, who have stopped being teenagers and who have grown into being successful adults with families and careers, and they're doing all sorts of awesome things. And we learned, I learned, that we had a lot more in common than we had differences but that if you had looked at us standing side by side, it never would have occurred to you. And in fact, when I moved from California, Southern California, to New York to teach high school, I was told by more than a couple of people, oh my God, what are you thinking? You're going to get killed. Which to me is tragic, because nothing could have been further from the truth. My students in New York, who, if you judge a book by its cover, are nothing like me, took better care of me, better care of me when I was pregnant, <laughs> Patrick Oyeku brought me yogurt in the morning because he would say, Miss, baby needs some calcium. Which, where do you get kids like that? He was a junior at the time. Lovely. All of the kids that I taught were marvelous. But it wasn't the kids in New York who were dangerous. It was the white fraternity boy on my dorm floor at UCLA who was dangerous. And looking at the books that we've read, when I, t <laughs> when I talk to people who aren't readers about the books that we do on Craftlet. Often, they will get that, <laughs> that glazed kind of look on their face, like, oh, old books. And so then I have to explain to them that, you know, when we did Gull Gulliver's Travels, one of the things we learned was that the scene that people complained about the most in the Jack Black version of Gulliver's Travels, yeah, the one where he's peeing all, <laughs> all over the castle, that's in the book. Or, or that a character who's really, truly reprehensible in Bleak House spontaneously combusts. Or I'll read them a chunk of Three Men in a Boat, maybe the part about the cheese. And you can't stop laughing. Because again, the stuff that motivates us, the stuff that matters to us, the stuff that brings us together is always the same. And the books are hard if you don't have context, or they seem, they might seem kind of old and creaky and foreign at first. But I think we've all learned that once you get context for these books and you understand where they started or, or what was going on at the time, like War of the Worlds, what was going on at the time when they were being written, the whole thing opens up and it makes so much sense and it seems so modern over and over and over again. 500 episodes worth of over and over and over again, we are more similar than we are different. So that's my political stance, the only statement I can make to all of the screaming hordes of people who are trying to divide us and gaslight us and convince us that the other, capital O, is a threat to our future, to our family, to our resources, whatever. The only real threat is division over and over and over again. Ben Franklin said, if we don't hang together, we will most surely hang separately. He also said a bunch of other stuff about how the country had lasted about 200 years before we fell apart and, and needed a despotic ruler. That was, his, <laughs> that was his last happy letter to the Constitutional Convention. Nonetheless, still I persist, because books matter, and people matter, and knowing how to read matters. Because if you don't know how to read, you don't know how to read the Constitution, you don't know how to read a rental agreement or or an employment contract, you're going to get played. So if the only useful thing I do in life, aside from raising my boys, is to keep pushing great books at people, then I guess I'll keep going. And the next book's going to be fun. It's going to be more rollicking. 
<laughs> and it'll surprise you in its moral ambiguity at the end. Except it probably won't surprise you all that much because I'm putting it on Craftlet. Yet another book that everyone thinks they know and probably really doesn't so much. I sure didn't. And that next book is Treasure Island by a Scotsman, Robert Louis Stevenson. It's going to take me a little while to prepare for it. I will figure out how to make this work. I am not at all certain when it will come out or when it will be back. I am working on the importance of being earnest. We'll see how that goes. I'm still hopeful. But Craftlet will be back with a lot of R's <laughs> and some buried treasure and a peg wig and a pirate. Pirates are fun when they're old fashioned and wielding a cutlass instead of other things that can be weld wielded welded we wool <laughs> speaking of i'm gonna go find some wool and make my kid a freddie mercury doll because there's an awesome crochet pattern out there that's calling my name all right you take care have a great one i'll talk to you soon with a pirate bye a big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>